Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. He's here visiting us all week, and he's going to speak to us about computing Hilbert modular forms on real quadratic fields. So I want to thank Christine for inviting me here. Yeah? And unfortunately, I'll be recycling <laughs> a talk that I gave before. Um, I mean, it's a talk that I gave back in Calgary, but here yeah, I'm making it just specifically for real quadratic field. When I first gave it, I made it in a more general content, but here yeah, I'll restrict myself to quadratic fields. Um, so what I want to do is first start by motivating um, how I started being interested in the computational aspect of Hilbert modular form. And uh, one of my main motivations is basically that when you look at uh, the theory of classical modular symbols, then um, it's a theory that provides us with uh, both a very theoretical and classical a very theoretical and computational uh, understanding of a classical modular form, especially thanks to uh, the database by William Stein and Cremona. But in contrast, if you look at Hilbert modular form, even in the simplest case of a, a quadratic field, a real quadratic field, um, some of, I mean, there are still a lot of aspects that are not very well understood. Um, for example, I mean, the eichler shimura construction, which is um, a theorem in the case of classical modular form, even for a real quadratic field, we don't know uh, that uh, construction in general. It's something conjectural. So one of my goals was basically to create uh, a database of Hilbert modular form on real quadratic field, and then use that database to experiment on some of the most classical of some of the current conjecture in the area, such as the eichler shimura construction, and then BSD. Um, so that was mainly, uh, those are the motivation uh, of my work on Hilbert modular form, especially on real quadratic field. So what I'm going to do is, um, the, I, I will not, unfortunately, I will not define what Hilbert modular form are themselves. I will uh, define a, a, a Hecker module and show you how to compute that Hecker module. But that Hecker, Hecker module through the black box that would be Jack, the Jack e. Langland correspondence will give us the space of Hilbert modular form. Um, so th that's what I'm going to do. Um, so first I will recall the theory of automorphic form on the definite quaternion algebra and then the Jacques Langland correspondence. And then I will then present a group theoretical description of that space of automorphic form and show how one uses that to give a better way, to get a better way of computing Hilbert modular form. Um, then I will give you, um, I'll present the algorithm and give you some numerical results. And then I'll uh, make some concluding remark. And if you have any question after that, or maybe before, then I'll be answering those questions. So let me start by making some basic uh, notations. So here we, f is would be a real quadratic field. And I will assume for simplicity that the class number is 1. O f would be the ring of integer of the field f. The, the, set of in the, the set of real embedding here is really just two elements, but they would be denoted by A, you send it to A tau, where tau is uh, the embedding. So the, the, the Adele ring of F would just be denoted A, and throughout the talk we will fix an integral ideal in the field F. Um, so I'll be using P to denote a prime in the field F, and uh, I'll pi sub p would just be a totally positive generator here, which we can think of as a uniform as well. 
So when dealing with Hilbert modular forms, so the weight now would consist of the, a vector. So here, for example, for quadratic field, the weight would be a two-component vector that I will just denote k, that I will just denote k. And I will assume that all the k have the same parity. So, um, so now I will g um, give you the setup for the definition of automorphic form on, the, on a definite quaternion algebra. So basically, if I were to define um, what those automorphic forms are, I would start by choosing a quaternion algebra. So it would be a definite quaternion algebra, which is ramified only at infinite places. And uh, this is possible because um, the degree of the field is even. So we know that uh, if you, you are looking at quaternion algebra over a given field, up to isomorphism, they will be classified by the the set of ramification. So you know that that set of ramification must have even cardinality. And if you take any set of even cardinality, uh, any, finite set, uh, any finite set of places of even cardinality, then you, would always find, you can always find a quaternion algebra with that specific set of ramification. So we know that we can find such a quaternion algebra. Um, now, in that quaternion algebra, we would also fix a maximal order that I would call R. And then for our integral ideal N, we will choose an Eichler order Rn of level N, which is contained in uh, the maximal order R. And uh, what we do then is that for each prime P, we can we fix a splitting of the quaternion algebra at that at that finite prime. Remember, the ramification is only at infinity. So for each finite prime, you can fix a splitting, and you can even add the extra condition that the ring of integer be isomorphic to the ring of matrices with, with entries in the in OP, OFP. And then we fix a Galois extension of uh, of F. Which, is, which split the quaternion algebra B. So that, um, we will need that last um, field K in order to split the quaternion algebra itself at, uh, so that we can use it to define the, the weight representation. So, the, so the, 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 field, the Galois extension K that we chose, we basically um, use a splitting, I mean, it would be a splitting field of the quaternion algebra B and we fix a splitting uh, like this, which we call J. And we let the group, the algebraic group, be the, the, the algebraic group J, uh, G be um, the restriction of scalar of the multiplicative group given by our quaternion algebra. So, um, so um, the weight representation usually, so using the weight vector that I mentioned at the beginning, you would define the weight representation. I would not give, um, uh, I won't give any uh, detail here. The example that I'll be giving you would just be actually the trivial representation, which would correspond to the parallel weight to two situation. Um, but usually what that weight representation is, is, it consists of symmetric powers of the two-dimensional vector space on which we know that the, this group acts uh, um, via its embedding uh, J that we defined earlier. So the weight representation it would be uh, just an irreducible representation of this, the, the, the real Lie group or J, uh, JR. That's what a weight representation would be. So, so having defined what uh, the weight representation is, we can now define this, the space of automorphic form of level N and weight K on the quaternion algebra B. So this would be the complex vector space that we define by SKBN, which would consist of the set of function that goes, uh, the set of function defined over this Cauchy space. So the finite, the finite Adele on G mod out by the compact open defined by the Eichler order with value in the weight space or the weight space LK. And you want those functions to be invariant by the stroke action that we have here. Uh, so F stroke 
f stroke gamma would be equal to f where gamma is a q rational point uh, where where little gamma is a q rational point on the group g hmm? can you say uh, uh, about l, l, sub k, what's l sub k is the weight representation so basically it's a, an irreducible representation that is defined uh, um, so you have your weight your in, your weight uh, The definition, the weight representation. The weight representation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the weight representation would be an irreducible. Uh, it's a tensor product of symmetric powers of this vector, and you choose those those powers. You basically chose them depending on k. Um, so it would give you an irreducible representation, and um, I can basically. Um, I mean, you know that if you just in one component, you know that in one component, um, I should be careful because. So, if you are one component. Um, here you have k, let's say, minus 2. In one component, this is, so v and k would be integers. So in one component, this would be an irreducible. What does it say there, determinant? Yeah, the determinant, I mean, the, the determinant representation to the power of v, the tensor to the power of v, and the symmetric to the power k minus 2. And so if you have one, one in one, each component, you would have an irreducible factor like this. And you take the tensor product over the two real places. So that's how you construct the all day. So what do you require for v? Uh, v is defined, um, yeah, v, v, v depend on k. The def, I can, um, you, you basically, um, I, Yeah, um, I, V usually, I, so you have the, I, so V is, is um, T is usually the vector. In this specific case, T would be the parallel weight, 1, 1. And V is usually obtained by, um, uh, if I remember correctly, so V would be N minus, I need to, uh, M is, I would have to, I don't remember the, def the definition in detail, but, but usually V, you first parallelize the weight vector and then use that to define V. And uh, that gives you the, um, the weight representation. I'll have to, to review that maybe. Hmm? Is it parallelized? Yeah. Okay. So you, um, so basically you take N, so in fact what I, so what you need, you choose, um, I think you choose, um, you choose M, you would choose M in Z such that um, I think K minus M would be 2T. So you can always choose, uh, I think this should be 2 square. And um, so now in the definition of to define the the component, um, I just can't remember the definition. I'd have to check. Maybe I don't know if I have it defined somewhere. I don't know if I have it defined somewhere, but um, yeah, maybe I'll I'll check later. Then I'll tell you how to parallelize the vector. So. Um, Um, so, and um, G was the algebraic group, which is the restriction of scalars of, of Yeah, of the, of the definite yeah. quaternion algebra. Oops. You had a B cross and that was, um, was it supposed to be that B tensor K? Sorry. Um, like hmm? On the previous slide, the previous slide, or no, one that, that was 
Yeah. B crosses B, tets are K, units? Oh, oh, you mean the, yeah, what I mean by B cross, so the, you mean the point on B cross? Yeah, so for any A algebra, the, oops. For any algebra, what I mean by B cross, yeah, it would be just B tensor with A, and then you take the unit. So that's what I mean by the group B cross. Um, so that's what I mean by G. So G A, if you take an A, um, if you take a Q algebra A, then you would tensor with. That's what I mean by the group G. Yeah, there's an algebra group that is determined by B cross. So if we are this, oops, I think I'm having a lot of trouble with the microphone here. So. Yeah, so I mean, via this, you. This, Hmm? So, what's the? Well, there should be a F in the formula that defines the restriction of scalars. So A is defined over Q. Yeah, A is. There's no F anywhere. Yeah. Um. You need to tensor A up to F, and then tensor over Q. No, the so F. The F right. No, no, so no, no. G of a for no. Yeah, here I'm defining g of a for any. A. So what is the f? So the idea is that the f rational point, the q, sorry, the q rational point of this group, should be b itself. So that's that's the the the, the point. So if you take the q rational point here, and this would be b. Uh, um, yeah, sorry. So. Yeah, if you take the Q rational point, this would be B, B tensor with. Um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, so um, yeah, so the space of um, automorphic form of weight k on the quaternion algebra B with level f will just be given by um, will be given by um, by um, by the set here. So as I said, it's the set of function uh, that is defined over this um, with value in the weight space, and then there are invariant under the stroke action by gamma, where with gamma would be any Q-rational point here. And the stroke action is just defined here. So F stroke gamma applied to an element G would just be F gamma G, and then you let gamma act on the left. So G would be in the finite del, and gamma would be uh, here. Here? Um, no, no, the question won't be compact. I mean, this is the level structure here, so I'm modding out by the, the level structure. So on that space of automorphic form, well, usually you have the Hecke operator, and I guess the, 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 intro, the what makes automorphic interesting is all the arithmetic properties that are 
related to, that come from the action of Hecke on that space of automorphic form. And the way you define the, the, the Hecke operator is that if you take a finite Edel on the group G, then you can write this double coset space. Um, so R, and, R hat N cross U, R hat N cross U, then you can write it as this double coset space. And the Hecke operator given by this double coset here would just be um, the, the map that sends the, the function f to this summation here where the stroke action is given by the, the representative of the, the double coset decomposition that we have here. Um, so, in fact, you can be, you can be uh, more precise about the Hecke, the Hecke algebra itself. So, for any prime P, remember we chose pi to be a uniformizer of uh, that prime earlier in the, in the talk. So, you can define the operator 2P give as, as given by um, uh, the, cos the coset of the, the, the matrix 1 pi on the diagonal and then 0, 0 on the anti-diagonal. Then what you can say about the Hecke algebra is that it would be generated by the operator TP, that those operator TP. So this is, um, so you have the space of automorphic form here, and then you have the definition of the Hecke action that we just gave. And so, so now what I'm going to say is that if you, uh, the, the Jacques Langland correspondence, as I said, this is the black box that says that the space that we just defined, if you compute that space, then what you would get would be the, 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 Heck, uh, the Hecker module of Hilbert modular cast form of level n and weight k on your field f. So what I'm going to do next is give you a way to compute that space. Um, the, 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 the space that we just defined. So what I'm going to do is give you a, a, a way to compute that space via the theory of Brent module, or I should say modify Brent module. So what I'm going to do is... Um, Do you Yeah, I think depending on how you choose the quaternion algebra B, yes, you would uh, be dealing with super special point. Uh, I mean, in higher dimension, we'll be dealing with the super special locus. That's the type of thing Christine and uh, Dennis are doing. So we describe the point, um, the uh, correspondence with the super special ability, right? So the, the uh, super special orders So, I mean, my order won't be, I mean, the reason why I chose my maximal order to be ramified only at infinity is that it gives me the full space of modulo, um, so it gives me the full space of Hilbert modular form on my field F. But if you choose a super, I mean, if you choose a super, uh, super special order, then you would have a restriction on the image. You won't get the full space. Um, so, so the jacket like Okay. Yeah, it, it works still, but it would tell you that the image of the map in this case would consist of the, the, the automorphic form that are special or super caspidal at the ramification. I mean, your super special order has a ramification set that is non-empty. I mean, that consists more than the infinite set, and you would have some restriction on the finite prime. Could you show again the map, uh, the map? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I really didn't define it explicitly, but I just said that, um, so we have ramification only at the infinite prime of B. So what this would it mean is that, that the module that I defined here, the module that I defined here would consist of, uh, I mean, the module I defined here depend on B. But what the Hecker correspondence says that I can basically remove the B here, and I will have SKN, this, all the, the cast form of uh, weight K and level N on my space, uh, on, my, on, on my field. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm mapping to, okay. So the map will go from, uh, this is the module that I define. And the map would go into um, what you can call SK of N, which would be Hilbert modular form. Um, So <laughs> it would be the. The Hilbert modular form of weight k and level n on f. So this is my space, and this is the, the automorphic form that I define. And the way um, here we will have an isomorphism by the choice, um, I need to be c careful here because um, here I, I need to mod out by a certain space. So it would, I would just say that there is a surjection here. No, it's really. It's just that there exists. Yeah, there exists a map. I mean, you, it's a Hecke equivalent. Uh, um, I mean, if you mod out by the appropriate submodule, it would be a Hecke. Hecke. It, I mean, it's just there exists a map. It's not yeah. in any way canonical. No. So just like in the yeah. So, so, so if you change, if you replace this order by a super special order, then the image, you would have some restriction that depend on the ramification. So the, and the, the image would be defined in terms of the, the decomposition of the corresponding automorphic form. So you have a, something here, then you can, dec you have an automorphic representation, you decompose that automorphic representation as a tensor product. And the image here, the local factor at the ramification would be spatial or supercaspital. So that's how you get the description of the image here. Kind of analogous to new forms and old forms in the possible case? No, not exactly. Not exactly. Uh, so changing the ram primes that ramify B in the case over Q, mm -hmm. is similar to changing the primes if um, the, the form is allowed to be old out there. No, it, it's really not. Um, I mean, usually the map is actually defined. If you go to the level of automorphic form, the map would really be defined actually using new form. So if you have a new form, you, you look at the corresponding automorphic form, and it's the decomposition of that automorphic form into local factor that give, tell you what the image is. So it's really not about uh, how to split the space into old part and new part. It's, it's a different statement. Because you, you, you basically go from, uh, I mean, um, I guess here you could see that here you have something which is really of kind of combinatorial nature. With the choice that I made, this thing here is of combinatorial nature. But the structure here is much richer in some sense. But as Hecker module, you, if you have an element here, it would give you an element here. But Space of all Hilbert modular forms. Yeah. Level n, where t to be bigger than. Uh, and, uh, can you have automorphic forms for a fixed d? What? So, uh, Sorry. Well, I don't understand why is this uh, not so No, I mean in the specific case in my no, it's the, in the specific case that we are dealing with. We have no ramification. The ramification is only at infinity. So. Since the ramification is infinity, you don't have any, I mean, no, the discrete series cannot be super special or super caspidal. So the restriction on the image is kind of a empty statement. That's why you have the surjection here. Um, In general, it's not going to be a um, if, Okay, I, if the weight is non-parallel, then you would have an, uh, for non-parallel weight, you would have, um, if k is not, like 2, 2, then you would actually have an isomorphism. 
when k is not 2, 2. But when k is 2, 2, then you need to mod out by a submodule. That the submodule of the function uh, that are obtained by composing with the determinant map, then you need to mod out by that one, and you would get uh, a, an isomorphism in that case. So what I mean is that the kernel of this surjection is not always zero, especially when uh, you have a parallel, in the parallel weight case, the kernel is non-trivial. Um, so, no, but I'm not. No, but hmm? no. What do you mean by uh, an automorphic rep in the reverse sense? Um, you need to be to be careful because the because um, what I. What I meant is that this, this thing, you can go into the space of, I mean, if you have some f here, then you can attach an automorphic representation here. That's what I meant. And here you would have um, you have f here, you can attach an automorphic representation. So that's what I meant. So the Jack and Langland, the most often the statement is really on this level here. So this form, you can write it as a tensor product over the V. And then you, you have the same thing here. Um, and now, so if you take an element here, what is the image here? So the image would consist of the image of this map here, which people usually call JL, so the image would consist of the form here, such that uh, at the ramification, the pi would the pi v would be special or super casphedal. Uh, sometimes people say just uh, square integrable. So that's the restriction you would have on the image. So, but in if so. Um, but our quaternion algebra here is totally definite. So at the infinite places, you don't have any special uh, supercaspidal uh, condition. It's an empty statement. So that's why in this, this particular choice, you would have a kind of bijection. So it's, it's really, um, is that better enough? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Um, okay, so let's go back to how we um, compute this uh, uh, module that we just defined. So in order to, to compute the module, I will start by choosing a finite set of ideals. So we, ch we choose a finite set of ideal that we call G alpha, alpha going from 1 to H, the class number. And those ideal would represent the right ideal classes of the maximal order R. And um, for each alpha, we would let I alpha be the ideal that is generated by the, the ideal that we chose. And of course, we can assume that the first order R1 is just equal to the maximal order R we started with. Um, um, then uh, for each prime, we, have, we can fix a splitting of the maximal order, the completion of the maximal order R alpha at P. We can fix a splitting, which, uh, give, which is just giving an isomorphism of this order with the 2 by 2 matrix, uh, matrix algebra here. And so via this isomorphism that we, we can piece the isomorphism, the local isomorphism here, into uh, an isomorphism of this compact open onto the compact open, which is uh, given by uh, the 2 by 2 matrix with, in, with entries in, the, in OF hat. And so via this isomorphism, the R alpha hat cross will act transitively on this projective space here. And um, just let this be, um, I guess, I let infinite alpha be the, uh, the fixed point of uh, 
of the compact open that we defined here. This compact open, we actually correspond to a Eichler order. And the fixed point for this compact open, we will denote it infinity alpha. And uh, you would see why I'm making that definition very shortly. So one more definition is for each of the maximal order R alpha, you can now define the space of automorphic form of weight k and level n on that maximal order as the space of function here. So it would be the space of function on, onto this projective space if we value in the weight, weight space. And now there would be invariant under the, the, the stroke action here where gamma is a unit in this maximal order. And now this is how you define the stroke action. And you see the advantage here is now this is a finite space. So you have a set of function and a finite space, which is, and so this thing can be very nicely computed. Yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah. That's what the, the next statement would be. So so you have this, and now the, what you want to do is between each of those, you want to define a Hecke action between each of those space. So basically, what we do here is you you are restrict you are kind of defining now um, automorphic form using integral model of your quaternion algebra. So the maximal order in the quaternion algebra would give us integral model on the quaternion algebra itself. So what you are doing is that you are defining automorphic uh, form on each of those integral models. And the next statement would be that to get uh, the automorphic form on the quaternion algebra itself, you would have to take all the integral model into account, which is really similar to the... Uh, to the GL2 case. So you have GL2 case, the class number would give you all the integral models. And if you want all the, if you want a Hilbert modular form on uh, your in GL2 over your field, then you need to specify all the component. And the component would be at the integral model or the class number of your group in that case. So now that we define the, the, those space, you want to define the Hecke action between them. And now, to define that Hecke action, what I do, I, I, have a, I choose a prime P in my field F. Again, um, here um, I will assume that the prime, P is prime, uh, the prime P is prime with the level N. And if we choose a totally positive uniformizer of P, then we, def we can define the set here, which I call N alpha P, where I'm taking all the element U in the ideal I alpha time, the conjugate of the ideal I beta. And I want the scale norm, the, the scale norm of u by, uh, n, uh, by this ideal to be equal to pi. And I'm only taking those elements up to a multiple to the left by, uh, by a unit in this maximal order. So I'm taking all this, the element of scale norm u in this ideal up to a scalar factor that would be here. Uh, in R alpha. So when you do that, then you can define a Hecke action between oh, the different integral models. So a Hecke action between this integral model given by R alpha and this integral model given by R beta would just be sending the function f to this sum here where the stroke action is taken over the u which lie in this set that we just defined. So that will give you a Hecke action between the two the, these two spaces. And uh, to be more specific, when you let this thing act, you need to be careful. So you would only take the summation on the u's, which would not have a degenerate action on x. So that's the only re uh, requirement when you are defining the action. And when you do that work, the theorem here says that this space would be isomorphic to this direct sum under the definition of the Hecke action that we just gave. And um, the way you define the comp, so you have a function f, you would send it to h, to a vector with h component, and the component alpha is just given by f alpha x acting on this point would just be f applied to x times g. 
So when you do that, then this theorem gives you an isomorphism of Hecke module. So, um, and again, the advantage here that on this space you can, so the advantage of uh, transferring to the right hand side for the computation of Hecke is that you get rid of the, the definition of, uh, you get rid of, of the Heichler order which give you the level structure. So you are not working, I mean, the Heichler order kind of disappear behind this quotient because when you quotient the maximal order R alpha by the Heichler order R n alpha, you, you would get now this projective space. So that's how you get rid of uh, the Eichler order. And so if you want to compute the, this Hecker module, you can do some pre-computation that only depend on maximal orders and then use that pre-computed uh, set to, to do the computation for all the different levels that would come later. Uh, so let me make some comment about the way I implemented the algorithm. Um, so, basically what you do, you start by computing, um, so you would have to compute the, the ideal uh, representative of ideal classes of your quaternion algebra. This is um, the most important step actually and um, we still need to make that part of the algorithm efficient. And I'll, um, so, once you compute those ideal classes, then you can compute the unit group here, R alpha. Um, you take the unit of norm one, modulo of plus or minus, and then you compute the set n alpha beta p, which, which are necessary for the computation of the, the Hecke action. Um, so for the example that I did, I actually chose all the prime up to norm 100. And I mean, in most cases, you know that you need relatively few prime in order to discriminate between all the modular form. Just usually three or four prime are usually enough to tell you that all the form are, uh, I mean, to tell you what are all the possibilities for your modular form. So when you, you can compute that first, so in that first part you compute the, the unit group and the collection of n alpha p and then you store uh, them. And now if you are interested in the form for level n, what you need is, I mean, you, you need to compute this, pro, this uh, projective space which is a finite set. And then you need to compute some local splitting of the maximal orders here. And those local, those splitting can be computed fairly easily. And now via those splitting, you let the unit group that you computed in the first step act on those projective space. Then you compute the orbits. So you would have to compute the orbit and um, a collection of fundamental domain. And now basically the Hecke action, you just, um, um, sorry, I need to, so if you are interested in non-parallel weight form, then for those non-parallel weight form, you would have to compute the stabilizer of each element in uh, the fundamental domain that you have. Because those, stab those uh, stabilizer would come into the computation of the Brent matrices. And I mean, this step here is optional. I mean, if the space is really, I mean, if the dimension of the space is really big, then you would need to compute a lookup table or hashing table for the orbits, so where you record data that would be useful uh, that you can use later. So when you have this, then uh, uh, the Brent matrices are just expressed by the way uh, your Hecke operator act on those fundamental domain. That's how you would express the Brent matrix. And so, I mean, so with all that, uh, pre-computation, you, you can now compute all your, your Brent matrices. So the Brent matrices in this case would be block matrices, uh, and the, the block would be given by the different uh, ideal, ideal classes. Um, so here is one, 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 one of the examples that I did. So the, the, the quadratic fields here, that I started with was Q root 29. 
And in that case, the class number of the quadratic field is 2. So what that means is that at level 1, we will have an Eisenstein series. Of, so those are the form of parallel weight 2, 2. So at level 1, we will have the Eisenstein series, and we will have a form that is uh, not a Eisenstein series. And it's exactly this form here. So you are dealing with the maximal order itself. Um, the, ideal, the, the ideal n would just be 1 here. So you're... No, you would have two forms, one Eisenstein series. For the parallel way 2, 2, you'd have one Eisenstein series and uh, one... Uh, Forms yeah. Yeah. It's like the MK on the right-hand side of here. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, so in this, yeah. So that's so that's what I was. So that's actually what I was saying. So for the parallel way to to here, I need to mod out by something that is non-zero, and that something that I have to mod out would be the Eisenstein uh, series. So I would only have this cast form here. If I compute this space, it would be two-dimensional. So why do you call it SK instead of MK? Here? No, in the upper left. Upper left. In the upper left of your square. Yeah? No. Oh. Upper. Why do you call it SKB? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you call it MK? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I guess, yeah. I, I know. I, I think I should have changed that notation long ago. But, yeah, you're right. I sh I sh so yeah. Uh, yeah, I should have called it MK because I do have... Um, things that are not caspidal, yeah. So I would have to mod out by something that corresponds to the Eisenstein series, then I would be left with this so thing. Yeah. Uh, they have parallel bases in the form of For Hilbert, yeah, for Hilbert modular form, I think, yeah. For Hilbert modular form. You mean here? Yeah. No, in, in general, if I give you a level n, then yeah. you the I mean, the, the, the number would always depend on the class number of the base field, right? The Eisenstein series, the, the number would be the same as the narrow class, the narrow class of the, your field. Uh -huh. Yeah. Each ideal, narrow ideal class gives you Eisenstein series. Um, so this form, actually, you can check that it corresponds to a, a lip, an elliptic curve with everywhere good reduction. I don't have the equation here, but I think I have it somewhere in my notes. So in what sense does it correspond to an elliptic curve? Uh, you can find an elliptic curve that is defined over Q root 9, which is modular, and uh, the corresponding form would be this. So if you compute the APs, the, f the APs of your, f your elliptic curve, you would see that they match this first form here. Yeah. You prove that? Hmm? You prove that the curve really does have this? That it's, it's matched. Um, yeah. You, you can check. Huh? You proved it. For this, for this. That, no, it was, the, the proof of the modular arch is not me. Uh, it's, um, it's a matter. I think the curve was found a while ago, actually, by Tate. Yep. It's the curve for Q root 29 was found by Tate. But, um, but I think with um, the result of uh, Skinner and Wild, then you can prove that it's a modular curve. And uh, it would then correspond to uh, this thing. Yeah. But the proof of the modularity wasn't me. Really? I did it. I did for a few examples on Q root five, but not for this specific one. Yeah. Did you find a new elliptic curve? I mean, some of the curves that I found over Q root five, yeah, they are new elliptic curves. Um, so one one that one thing that I think would be interesting is here, this thing would correspond conjecturally to. A, an abelian surface with multiplication by q root 5. And it would, it would be nice to find the equation for that abelian uh, surface. So I missed, what determines the dimension of the abelian variety that has that modular form 
Uh, the dimension would basically be, uh, you mean here? Well, you're saying here it's an ability surface, but here it's still a curve. So, uh, yeah, so the dimension would be, I mean, the field of definition here is a qu the quadratic field Q root, I mean, the field of CM would be this quadratic field of, uh, um, this quadratic field Q root, Q root, um, Q root 5. So the way you decompose the space, the, d the dimension of each irreducible <coughs> constituent will tell you what is the dimension of the corresponding uh, variety. At I mean, this is a conjecture, actually, because we don't know the eichler shimura construction um, for arbitrary field. And that's why I think it would be more, it would be even interesting to know if you, we could match this form to an abelian surface. And this is some of the things that I'm um, working on. Yeah, yeah. Except that for the classical case, we know basically how to get those variety. I mean, yeah. you just decompose the Jacobian under the action of Hecke, and it gives you uh, the corresponding uh, geometric object. But in this case, we, I mean, in this case, the construction is conjectural. So you, you can decompose the cohomology of your Hilbert modular variety. And so you would say that each piece would correspond to a motive. But we don't know. I mean, there is no formal proof. So just finding example where you can determine that motive, I think, would be uh, pretty interesting. And the, um, so what I did is that for elliptic curve, some of the elliptic curve, I can compute the periods. And then from the period, I can, um, I can get the, the elliptic curve itself. But um, this usually requires a huge amount of uh, primes to get the period. And I wanted to find a different method where you would need much less, uh, much less prime. And I was exploring some of the things that you did. So there is an elliptic curve attached to it? Any rational name for it, but it's defined over C a priori? Yeah, it would be defined over C a priori, but, but you want to show. It appears that it actually is defined over Q. Yeah. And presumably in parallel weight bigger than, or anything other than weight 2, parallel weight 2, the thing looks like it's not defined over Q. No, it would be defined over the. For example, here, every variety that we get should be defined over. No, but like even for classical modular forms of weight 4, mm -hmm. you get elliptic curves, but they're not defined over Q. They're oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, OK. Is that similar for Hilbert modular forms? Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think conjecturally it should be. But for the parallel weight 1, one. You, for the parallel weight 1, uh, for the parallel weight form, yeah. for the parallel weight form, it should be defined over your base field. Yeah, no, I mean, two, sorry, parallel way 2, 2, okay. sorry, <laughs> sorry, okay. yeah. Because the parallel way 2, 2, they correspond to the decomposition of your, um, your. For a higher weight, there's an abelian variety over C attached to any new form. Is there an abelian variety over C? I, I can't tell, but I would expect that it's so pretty much. make an elliptic curve. You should be able to make an abelian variety. You just don't understand its rational. Yeah, model. yeah, I think so. I mean, it, Conjecturally, yes. The, the, again, the reason why I'm careful here is that we don't know the, the, the eichler shimura construct. We don't know in general. I mean, even for a quadratic field like this, you cannot say in general if. Uh, Sorry, but just for associating an elliptic curve or an abelian variety to a form, you don't need eichler shimura. Mm -hmm. You need that to be something that's, that's, um, that's rationality of property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can take the cohomology, but the, it's but it would just say that conjecturally there is a motive. So you, I mean, you could take the cohomology and get complex lattices, and from those you get complex tori. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 right. That's right. But that's right. You'd get. Yeah, actually, no, that's, yeah, sorry, that's right. Um, you would get that your abelian variety is defined over C. You would get that it's defined over C. But what you really want is to show that they are defined over the base field. And that's what, that's the computer. Hmm? You don't have an analog of J 
No. No, so that's what I, so that's some of the thing that I was doing over Q root five. So over Q root five I would I started for few for a few of those form, you compute the period of this. And again here it's trickier because when you compute the period you get periods that are actually mixed. Because you have a two differential two degree or two degree differential form here. So you get the period of the form tensor with the period uh, the period of the, the conjectural variety tensor with the period of the conjugate. So you get those mixed period and it's even so it's quite tricky to actually recover the curve the curve from those period. But uh, I managed to do it for a few examples and you can check that the variety is actually How defined. Many did you need? For the smallest prime like thirty one I would need to go up to like uh, all the prime of norm uh, all the ideal of norm less than four hundred. To, to be able to recognize the, the, the coefficient. So once you consider those uh, yeah. uh, you have a pairing, I mean you have the intersection pairing which says that uh, the the intersection pairing would tell you that they satisfy the Riemann condition, so you know that there would be a complex, uh, there would be abelian varieties. But the only thing you can say is that they are defined over the complex. Okay. That's weird, isn't it? Like, like in, in the classical case, you use the Peterson inner product. Mm -hmm. So the, the second example that I consider was 37. And again, you would have a, an elliptic curve with everywhere good reduction. And one interesting thing would be to find this abelian surface with multiplication by q root 29 here. Yeah. Um, for abelian surface, I really don't know how to do it. And I'm hoping that Christine would be able to help me because I want to use the Igusa invariant. For the elliptic curve, I use the J invariant to get rid of the mixity of the periods. And I'm thinking if you can use the Igusa invariant, then you would get rid of the mixity in, the, uh, in this case. Um, so I think that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, so yeah, so the last comment that I want to make is that the main step of the algorithm really require computing the ideal classes of your maximal order, which is uh, things that uh, Dennis and Christine are interested in. And uh, we came up with uh, a way to do that, um, William and I, which is kind of to exploit the, the tree, or the Ramanujan tree of uh, the definite quaternion algebra. And I mean, it's, we haven't implemented that yet, but uh, we think that should be an efficient way to compute uh, this ideal class. I mean, the, the ideal representative, not the ideal, yeah. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say is that for those forms, you want to be able to actually verify the Eichler Shimura uh, uh, construction or conjecture in those specific forms. So you for the, those parallel weight form, you do have complex abelian varieties, but it would be nice to verify that they are actually defined over the base field that you started with. And as I said, I did it for a few, 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 uh, for a few, few forms, but I still need to refine the to refine the algorithm. <coughs> so, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? <laughs> so, um, one thing I like to do is take, consider really varieties attached to modular forms and compute things about them mm -hmm. uh, related to the BSD conjecture. So you would have, presumably, you might have at least a conjectural strategy for doing something similar yeah. for really varieties attached to yeah. Hilbert modular forms, or at least conjecturally attached to Hilbert yeah. modular forms. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it's sort of a, a strategy for attacking or understanding computing with certain abelian varieties that aren't defined over Q, or defined over a, a, yeah. a bigger, actually real field. 
And uh, so I guess the first question is, what, what's the analog of, I guess, Ribbit's conjecture about which abelian varieties over totally real fields are supposed to arise from Hilbert modular forms? Oh, it's, it's the same, the GL2. Uh, to what? hmm? What's the conjecture? I mean, there would be GL2 type. I think there is a similar, I mean, it's, there's the conject. I think Henri kind of formulated a similar uh, okay. thing in one of his papers, the rigid local system and uh, Fermat last year on Henri Dama. So yeah, you would expect that uh, there would be a Did G. Did prove something like Robert proofs, such as source conjecture as formulated by uh, various people over totally real fields implies modularity of Mm, um, no, not some. No. No, I don't think there's any. I, th I think in specific cases, yes, but not. A, there's not a full general result. In direction. So we, no, no people know modularity for any GL2 type of feeling variety over Q of odd level mm -hmm. conductor that falls from spin mm -hmm. Yeah, they know, but they know it. 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 It's a little tricky though. In the case of the modular form, it's higher weight. You have to use higher weight modular symbols. That's what you integrate against the modular form. So, for example, you can take the delta function, which is a weight 12 modular form, and you can take higher modular symbols of weight 12 and integrate, and you get an elliptic curve attached to the Ramanujan delta function. But it's not defined over Q, it's defined over like C. There's a paper from the 50s that Shimura wrote about in which he proved that this construction where you take, um, you take some periods and you integrate it against the higher weight modular form gives you an appealing variety over C. And I think he uses the Peter Spinner product to prove it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the, the quadratic form he uses, yeah. The yeah. Peterson in a form, yeah. It's like, it's just some French paper from the 50s that uh, I'm sure. Because there is a, um, there's a whole bunch of work being done now, like Chong Hai No, I, I did. I had two approach. I mean, there's that approach that you mentioned where I look at modulo p. So I know the general form. I know the general form of the J invariant. And assuming that general form, I uh, for a minimal model, then I I um, I look at <coughs> modulo modulo is a finite set of prime. So if you look at modulo a finite set of prime, then if it gives you the right J invariant, then you kind of lift to uh, the global yeah. Uh, case. Yeah. So how do you compute so the J invariant plot of prime? Hmm? Where do you compute the J invariant plot of prime? Um, so what I, what I assume that is I, I have, um, so for example, I need to assume something on the discriminant. So I know, for example, the curve has multiplicative right. reduction. Right. Oh no, it, I, it's not from the the Fourier coefficient. So I assume like that my J invariant, yeah, I assume that my J invariant is of a certain form, yeah. and um, that I take my model of the elliptic curve as given by that J invariant. 
So then I look at the, the reduction of the model and see if it gives me the right oh, AP. So you do that for a finite set of prime, you would rule out many J invariant and you just left with one. Yeah, it is related in the sense that it's telling you some, the frame coefficient is telling you some information about the prime, what's happening at that prime, yeah. the number of points or whatever. Yeah. That yeah. Is. Yeah. It restricts the list of possible J yeah. invariants. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like so it's yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's so, curve Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. So the other method where you compute the period has some kind of advantage. So you compute the periods. Use this over Q2, like a chromatal elliptic curve by computing the A sub P and then trying to do some sitting process for yeah. an elliptic curve. And yeah. Yeah. No, I have um, no, the, no, I haven't. I mean, well, that's what you were saying. You were you were doing in that special for case so for the J. For, you did it for elliptic curves, you said. For the J invariant. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did. But, but I mean, the second method is you compute the period, yeah. the actual period. Standard. Yeah, that's the standard that's way. That's what I'm kind of wondering, like how these two approaches correspond with the. Well, I mean, the, the standard one's what everybody does, and the, one, the other one with seeking for Jane variants, I've never heard of it until just now, and it seems very clever. Um, you just thought of that, and because mm -hmm. you couldn't get very far with it. Yeah, I mean, you, this one, I cannot get far with the period, that's for sure. Should, I mean, well, this is, he said this to me, like, took a year and a half ago. That's, that's what very interesting. But I, I didn't, I mean, I, I told you at the time I tested few things, but I didn't implement it. I was still hoping that computing the period would be, I mean. So you the Yeah, the invariant, I wanted to use the period. I mean, I didn't think about sieving with the Igusa invariant. I wanted to compute the period with the Igusa invariant. But, the thing that's not but I think, I, now I'm thinking, just looking at fairy one, where I already need 300, I mean, all the prime up to 400, I won't be able to go very far, so I would have to maybe use the sieving method again. But the thing that's not clear about it is when you um, want to lift um, the J, like the, the coefficients, let's say, of the curve, mm -hmm. and you're looking, you, you have them on P, and you, you're trying to lift them to some field. A priori, you can lift them you know, to, let's say, like the fit factors or something like that. But you're doing this for a bunch of different primes. And how are you supposed to recognize, how are you supposed to kind of find a simultaneous lift of something that's defined in a bunch of primes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's... But the problem here is, is that these J invariants, if you lift them, you're lifting them to some huge number field, which is like non-ramified extension of the quartic CM field. No, sorry. Uh, so uh, you mean in the Igusa setting? You mean in the Igusa setting? Yeah, in the Igusa setting, you're not lifting. I mean, I guess the analog for the elliptic curve is, is that the elliptic curve is defined over the Hilbert class field mm -hmm. of the no, um, measure quadratic. Yeah, no, in my case, I know that, I, I know in my case that the elliptic curve, at least conjecturally, I know that it's defined over Q root 5. So basically what I'm doing is, all the prime, for each prime you fix a reduction map to the finite field and you, so it's via that reduction map that you would apply the Chinese remainder theorem. So what is the use of this? You basically want to compute those and rational reconstruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So should a set of primes compute mm -hmm. those coefficients module, this set module each prime? Yeah. And then from that you want to reconstruct to what that, that the module form? No, the the curve. J I want to, yeah, the J invariant. The J invariant. Oh, I think one very naive. So one very naive thing that I first did when I first. I will tell you what I actually did for the first time. So the way I did it for the way I did it for thirty one, when I first did it is so you have um, so your J invariant. You know that you can write it as a cube over delta E, where, both, where you know that A and... This is when you're curved in a special four dimension. Or, or 
yeah. So you have A F in here. And then um so and so the when I did it the first time, I let me I'll call this so let's say this is C four. So C four I wrote it as um A plus B time omega. See? So I mean so if you avoid the prime in the denominator here, so that's where I need the assumption and the discriminant. So if you then you can look at the reduction of your J invariant. Assume that you fix A and B in a certain range, then you can look at the reduction modulo. What do you do? Do you look for you find all J invariants such that the A P is say six or whatever? It's one yeah. Two. And what if there's more so, than one? No, I mean, if you try several prime, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. So no, but what I did here is fix, start by fixing a and b in the, uh, the range. Okay. So okay. if you fix a and b in a certain range, okay. so the range, for example, can you can have some idea on the range if you make some conjecture on the height of the curve, for example. So when you do that, then so a and b, a and b are integers. Yeah, you are sieving over an interval. So if you have a J invariant, then you look at the APs, and uh, by the time you reach two or three prime, you know that you can throw it away, and try a different one. I. That that was the first. This is the first, when I first implemented. This is what I did. But now what I'm thinking is, is to refine it by using. Hmm? This is the normal change to read it there already. No, no, yeah, th 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 that's what I'm getting to that point. I'm, I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting to that, no, I'm getting to the Chinese remainder point. So this is the very naive way I first did it. So now what I'm thinking is that instead of doing this way, I would start by, so I assume that I have an integral model of my elliptic curve reduce that integral model modulo p, then look at the restriction that I would have on the j invariant. I mean, yeah. I would have a certain finite set of j invariant that satisfy the requirement on the AP. And then I can lift those coefficient modulo, uh, I can list those coefficient to my, by, to my ring OF for each of those prime and see if I can piece them together. So, Mm -hmm. uh, what? Like the height of the, the thing in the dump is how far you have to go. Yeah, I think uh, so. If you, as, yeah, that, actually, this is something that Jeff Jeff told me a few, I mean, just a month ago. Yeah, so it would basically be the the conductor to some, I mean, log the conductor, something like that. If you assume. Uh, the height of what? For the elliptic curve, uh, the, the height of the, the J invariant. So you have uh, the new, I mean, effective Chebotar of assuming GRH. So it would be something like log of, log of the conductor. Yeah. Yeah, and what is the conjecture that's telling you that the elliptic curve will be defined over OF or over the Bell quadratic field? It's the analog of Aikulashimura. It's the analog of Aikulashimura. I see. So you're saying that when you lift the coefficients, you're expecting to be able to lift them to this. In this in the elliptic curve case, you'd be lifting them to the real quadratic field. And yeah. what, in the higher dimensional case, you'd also be lifting to the real quadratic field? Or uh, yeah. yeah, the real quadratic field, yes. I don't understand your third approach. The, no. You mean? The, you, you work mod 3, mod 5, and mod 7. Yeah. Prime so mod, mod 3, mod 3. Yeah, the, yeah. I was thinking about lift. No, I'm thinking of no. I was thinking about the wire stress coefficient in that in that later case because I'm starting with a minimal model for the J invariant. This is what I did. So I I I searched for the A B in a range, but what I want is to start with the the minimal model. Are you again still seeing? Are you going to start yeah? With I'll be. Model? 
no, no, I, no, I want to vary the coefficient. So I'll assume here that. You were the J. Hmm? Here you were varying the J. Yeah, here I was varying the J. But what I want to do now is I have my model, I reduce it modulo yep. P. Yep. So if I reduce it modulo P, the coefficient will tell me that those coefficients will tell me that there is only a finite set of right. coefficients, a very, set. a very specific set that give me this. And that very specific set, for each prime, I can, so for each prime, I can lift the coefficient to my ring. So what do you mean by there is a specific set of coefficients? You just consider the set of all wire stress equations. The set of wire stress, the set of wire stress equations. You count the number of points. Yeah. You get that number. Yeah. And this makes perfect sense over Q as well. Yeah, it's it's the. So uh, hmm? So what I'm going to do is that. So for those prime, the ring that I want to use for my lifting would be, really. So the ideal, um, I need to be careful. So the ideal with which I want to apply my Chinese remainder theorem would basically be the product of the prime that I will consider. So the. It's just that you have like you have three different curves for each prime. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean right now that's that's the, that's the problem, but I'm thinking you there is still a way to uh I mean to make it to do it in a clever way. It'd be nice if you could somehow get a little more information to narrow down the number of possible yeah. wire stress equations yeah. given yeah. that could correspond to your elliptic curve. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could do, you could use the information about the, the discriminant itself that you have. Uh, I mean, the type of reduction, the type of the reduction you can, the conductor will tell you what is the type of the reduction of the curve. You could use also that to reduce, to restrict the coefficient for each prime as well. No, uh, not that many actually. If you work on five, if you work on ten primes and there's three curves for each. Three to the no, I'm ten. expecting you would. Yeah, I'm expecting you'd have fewer curves than that. I mean, I'm expecting you'd have very few curves in general. But I mean, I'm not. <laughs> For each Fourier coefficient, you fix it, that gives you like some yeah. you know, t, and then just look at the the order in the imaginary quadratic field that's determined by that number, and that to the class number of that tells you how many yeah. isomorphism classes of curves there are. So you know, as soon as you yeah, get a bigger class number, then that's how many curves you get. Are you, are you taking the restriction on the J invariant, the reduction type into account, and, and that's what you're saying now? So if I, it's because you said all the isomorphism classes, but if you add the extra information, for, for example, on the type of the, the reduction of the curve, you should be able to restrict the... What do you mean by the type of reduction? For example... Uh, no, I mean, if I look at the, the, the restriction of the discriminant, the discriminant is given by, by my level, right? So if I restrict that to, if I reduce that modulo P, yeah. it, would, it would cut down the, the, the size of the, the yeah, set that I'm dealing with. If you only have to take the elliptic curves, the isomorphism class is discriminant as a given residue class. Oh. And then just, yeah. Like, at least that cuts down the equations. But wait, that doesn't. Yeah. If the height of the elliptic curve is bounded by the orthogonal number, the total number of candidates is possible. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. I mean, if um, you mean in case I'm using this method here. The modular, no, the modular form and the conductor uh, as well. So, so 
I remember. Yeah, the level, I mean, the level of the conductor. So the conductor of the elliptical would be the level. So that would, if you are assuming that you have a minimal model, then it would give you some restriction on the discriminant. And so you can include the, the, re the, reduction, the reduction of the discriminant mode P into the data to cut down the size. Also, you said you're seeding to this interval. Wait, but there's, there's two. Yeah. Hmm? No, I. Th those are two different. Uh, there are two different. Uh, yeah, three, uh, what is a complex gradient? Two is seeking, and three is the Chinese remainder theorem by cleverly reducing the number of choices. I mean, exponential Chinese remainder theorem. Oh, the J yeah. No, no. The third one's the multiplier stress condition. So why don't you do it for the J braid using Chinese remainder? Wouldn't that be a fourth approach? Why use a wire stress equation? Just Compute yeah. all the J's that are giving the key. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I mean. And then try to assemble those together using yeah, Chinese remainder and rational well, reconstruction. Yeah, or you could just do yeah, it like, do it in large, larger, larger parameters. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I have, <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I mean, I'll have, to, I guess we could talk about that. You guys would give me more ideas about how to do that. But I really want to, I mean, I, I don't want to just get a database of modular form. I really want to also be able to possibly say what the corresponding geometric object would be. And it's, it's really what I'm, huh? It's also interesting to see what you can say about this. Yeah. For example, can you say something about the torsion subgroup? Yeah, for a, if, if there's an abelian variety defined over F associated to your form, like four comma two right there, mm -hmm. can you tell me anything at all about its torsion subgroup? Um, I, I mean, the, the there's a whole bunch of questions like that. Yeah. Means component group, means yeah. Without even computing it. Yeah. Without even computing it, what can you compute about it? Uh huh. Yeah, th those are things that you want to do. F I mean, for some of the, sorry, for a few of the examples that I did, yeah, you can say what the torsion group would be. So you, um, in fact, most I mean, most of the the the. Pr the most of the level, I, I tried many prime level, and actually many of those, the L function would vanish. So and you would have some, to yeah. I think most of the prime up to 100 that I tried, in all cases, the, the L function would vanish. So you have, you are, you have some torsion. Um, I think. F hmm? No, sorry, I mean, uh, non -van no, sorry. Did I say vanish? Yeah, sorry. No, it's non-vanishing. So, <laughs> for example, 31, you have, tor you have a, the torsion group is order 8 for 31, for example. So, the L function uh, is non-vanishing in that. 41 is the same. And, um, is there any way to tell whether the L function vanishes or not um, without actually computing equations for a curve? I don't. We actually I have the L yeah. yeah. Is that enough information to tell? You know, with modular symbols, you can tell whether or not it all function vanishes provably. Uh huh. Um, so no, I don't. Can say anything here, even approximately. I don't know. I guess this is one of the big problems. The fact that you don't have the you don't have the the modular symbols. I mean, that's really a, a headache. So you you are starting. Hmm? What? I think there's, I mean, there, there are, maybe, I think probably Paul will tell about, tell about that at MSRI. There are, now they have some kind of modular symbol approach, but except that it's not, I mean, I don't think it's, one is able to really implement it yet in an efficient way to compute Hilbert modular form. How does the vanishing work for modular? All you do is you just compare zero infinity with your modular form. And um, in order to pair zero infinity with the modular form, is that's the same as integrating from zero to infinity. But actually, because the modular form is a, it's a new form, it's an eigen form for the Aptian linear evolution. So you write the path from zero to infinity as a sum of two, two other paths from you know, i over root n to infinity. Okay. Then you end up just having to compute an integral from i over root n to infinity. And when you write down that integral explicitly using switching the order of summation and integration, then it converges very quickly. Right. But that, uh, that numerically allows you to quickly oh, compute okay. the value at one. Yeah, algebraically compute the value at one. 
um, you can compute just using line purely linear algebra over Q or whatever your, your uh, field is. You compute a homomorphism that has the same kernel as the Fourier mapping, and then you take the modular symbol zero infinity and take its image under that homomorphism and see whether or not you get zero. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's sort of silly, but it, but it algebraically. Yeah. 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 Oh, what, what I can do is the analytic approach. I can compute the period more or less in the same way you just did. There's, there's one other thing I want to say, is that you can use the, you, use, um, you can prove theorems that allow you to bound the, the denominator in L of 1 over omega, and to see that approximate computation can be used to prove a okay. assuming the bounds on the many constant, which in many cases. Sorry, mm -hmm. go so you can analytically no, analytically you can do more or less the same thing. So you yeah. you have um, you can I mean analytically you can say if it's uh, non-vanishing uh, or it's vanishing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can actually just stick it into Tim Dotschitzer's program probably. Uh, it, yeah, Tim Dotschitzer has this amazing program that it just takes the coefficients of a completely generic L series and information about the gamma factors. And it outputs the L function at any point you want. Oh, okay. Seven point three plus I or whatever. It's <laughs> so fun. Mm -hmm. so, but what is the disadvantage of just using the the Ico Shimura approach to constructing the um, abelian variety? Just the oh, number of coefficients. The, you mean computing the lattice period or what? Yeah, computing the period. Yeah, I mean you need way too many coefficients. I, I guess. So, so, hmm? so how do you so, know? Yeah, the period are mixed also. So you need to, see, that's one extra condition. So you first you need many coefficients to, because you see, the, the reason why you need more coefficients is that you would have totally positive unit coming into the summation when you are computing the period. So that would require more coefficient than you would, uh, expect in the the only unit in the over z would be plus or minus one, but now you would be dealing with powers of uh, the fundamental unit, for example, in the quad quadratic case, and that would require you way more coefficient than um, than in the classical case. And when you solve that problem, then the next thing that you have to do is uh, get rid of the mixity of the periods. I mean, so and. Uh, Hmm? The period lattice? Are they big? So I mean, you you have, I mean, you would have four. You have four. Uh, yeah, the period would be big. Yeah, if you in most examples that I compute the period, yeah, the pro, I mean, the product. You can see that they are bigger. When you recognize the elliptic curve, then you would see that the, the for the elliptic curve they are rather small, and then those product are, the product would be pretty big. And um, so, um, yeah, so you have that, I mean, you, you would have to get rid of the mixity of the period. And so it's, it's really, and one of the things is that if you want to compute too many coefficients, then, I mean, for Cremona, it has that trick, again, which use modular symbols. So when you have few coefficients, then using modular symbols, you have the trick to compute more coefficient. But I don't have that. I don't have modular symbols, so I cannot. I mean, I tried to see if I could still come up with a trick like he, he uses. Huh? It's but hard to compute another t. Like when you have a p bigger than 100, yeah. you have to go back to your original quaternion algebra that you want to work. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. So so you you can't you can't you can't. I mean. Yeah. I mean, I can't do that. So, if I would do that, then maybe it wouldn't be too bad to to compute the L function or the periods. But, but my, my impression is it's still way easier using your new method to compute. Yeah, the sieve. The sieve. No, no, no. I mean, just just using your method for computing um, S B K N. Mm -hmm. It's easier to compute a lot of A P than it would have been by computing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, it it's still faster. Yeah, huh? Way faster. Wait, wait, wait. Are there any examples where you 
Uh, if For the same, I mean, different conductors? No, I, um, no, I have, I haven't, um, even if they're like, Yeah, they're congruent mode two. <laughs> <laughs> they are congruent mode two, yeah. The the two here, I th I think they are, huh? The same the level. Yeah. Just the same level. The same level. They are both. Which one? Oh, you would this think is the one. Okay. Yeah. Wait, what is sorry? What is four comma two mean in the middle column? Where? Four comma two. Here, yeah? oh, the the norm of the level is four. Oh, I see. And the prime okay, is two. Oh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the second gets another to the norm. Yeah. Okay. So I guess the dimension two and a half would be about worse than the elliptic curve because what will happen is all you fix is the real quadratic field, mm -hmm. not the full CM field. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at these goose invariants, you're going to have to look through all the invariants corresponding to any field that has mm -hmm. that real quadratic subfield. Ooh. So there's more than just the class number there for each, for each prime, because you have to have the ones for each. Yeah, but my, I guess, yeah, that's not a very good news. My hope was that so you see, the trick that I'm using here is that I know that this is a ratio of two algebraic integers, and I know the bottom. So if I compute this to enough precision, I mean, again, here I would need to compute this and its conjugate. So that's how I would recognize this thing. So in here, I'm using the fact that this ratio is the ratio of two algebraic integers. So what I was hoping is that I could modify the Ikusa invariant and write them as ratio of algebraic integers in the same way I'm doing for those. And assume that those algebraic integers would still be in my field F. I mean, I don't know if I can do that, but I was, that's one of the things I wanted to discuss with you because I was hoping that I could still maybe modify the definition and assume that I can have them as r those kind of ratios. Because if I can do that, then I would be able to apply the same method of the J invariant, where I compute the period lattice and recover those J invariant exactly in this same way. But, um, but I don't, I mean, now it's, <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's, it's Seem, from what you're saying, it seems that maybe there might not be <laughs> any hope of doing that. Uh, well, I'm, not, I'm just not sure about what the total input to your algorithm is, besides the modular form, what, yeah. else, what else, what other kinds of information? The only, my input would be the, again, my input would be the modular form and the conductor. So, again... Uh, that sorry. Might be relevant, sorry. But I mean, that modular form, you have it, you have it explicitly as a, as a vector in terms of your construction, mm -hmm. which you shouldn't, but I think you should forget about that fact. There might be a lot of extra information. There. Maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. I, I don't know. I never thought about using uh, that extra information. I mean, I thought that the, the I mean, I, I think, I. I do think that even all that extra information, it give me much less information than the modular symbol would give you. And I don't know how to use, the, I mean, I think the, the only way I was thinking about using that extra information is working with isogenic classes of those varieties. So, because what this, this give me a hacker module that I can decompose um, 
and work with, I mean, get some sub lattices which would correspond to um, abelian varieties. So if I want to work with the variety without using the equation, I think I might still be able to do that using that extra information. But if I want to compute equation or things like that, I don't think I can, those, that data would be useful to me. Thanks. <laughs>